Hi folks, back again tonight. I'm Mike Bloom, going to join you in some chapter-by-chapter -chapter studying of the book of Revelation. And we spent the last three weeks talking about resurrection. It was just before Passover weekend, Resurrection Sunday, and I wanted to spend some time just on the resurrection itself. And if you haven't seen them, please go back and check them out. Three studies in the last three weeks, parts one, two, and three. And on YouTube, they're actually in a playlist. And so let's go ahead now. And I'm getting things set up here. Good to see everybody there tonight watching. Glenn Blair, Pauline, and LaRue Thompson. And I'm sure there'll be more. I might not have seen your name pop up yet, but Spread the word. Share it right now, and there could be people come in and watch this with us. But uh, let's just pray again, and let's get into the Word of God. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for all that are watching this and that will watch it. And thank you more than all of that for your Word. And lead us by your Spirit. Jesus, you said you'd send the Comforter to lead and guide us into all truth. Lord, let your Spirit guide us into all of you because you are the way, the truth. You are the Word. And being led into all of truth is all the Word. <coughs> Excuse me. And all of you, God, in Jesus Christ's name. So let's go ahead and continue. And just to show you where we left off, I want to just back up a little bit and... The last issue we talked about was once that we learn, and we've come to chapter 12, 13, and 14 of the book of Revelation, once we've learned about this dragon, who is Satan, the land beast, who is the false prophet, and the sea beast, who is this system that we have determined is Rome in the first century, uh... The question arises in our minds, well, what about the church? You see, up to this point, there's a lot of harrowing experiences, a lot of fearful things that we've read about. The beast and the image of the beast and making everybody take the mark. And we talked about how that the forehead represents the will of a person and the hand, right hand, represents the works or activities or a strength and power of a person dedicated to the beast. And I was teaching that when they heard Pilate say, shall I crucify your king? And they responded and said, we have no king but Caesar. They were giving their wills over to the will of Caesar and their might and abilities and activities in causing Jesus to be crucified to carry out Caesar's will. In fact, they even told Pilate, that you're not a friend of Caesar if you don't go through with this. So a lot of fearful things happening. So at this point in Revelation chapter 14, it's like a pause happens in studying the book of Revelation. And John is directed in this pause to just see a reminder from the Lord. Because in times when we're going through very hard persecution or in everyday life, we don't hardly have anything like that today in North America. Um, just in battles of life, we sometimes just need to pause and get some encouragement. And so that's what happens in Revelation 14. Will the church survive? What do we do in all of this? And in chapter 14 and 1, as if to answer that question, John said, I looked and behold, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Standing strong. Not only is there the Lamb, who obviously is Jesus Christ, standing on Mount Zion, but he's got an army with him of a hundred and forty-four thousand. And they're on a mountain standing, not defeated, not discouraged by any means at all whatsoever. And Mount Zion Again, remember the most oft-quoted prophecy in the Old Testament that you'll find in the New, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then in verse 10, 
Verse 2, rather, it says, Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. So here's a perfect example of Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2, actually already fulfilled. Jesus is in the midst of enemies, standing strong. It doesn't matter about the beast. It doesn't matter about the false prophet. It's though he's saying, let them do what they will. But I'm still king of kings and I'm on Mount Zion and things are going to change. And then we read of a series of victorious statements after Revelation 14 and 1. So we already saw that the enemies of the church at this time in history, which I claim is the first century, required one to be faithful to the point of martyrdom, faithful to the point of death. It even said in Revelation chapter 12, they loved not their lives unto the death. That was a very hard time in history. And many generations since then, there have been people somewhere being martyred for Jesus Christ who had to be faithful until their deaths. In fact, right now in China, they say that in the last few years, there have been more Christians martyred than all of the last several centuries beforehand. And so we're in a very hard time now. So chapter 14 acts like a pause, and it's showing John visions of victory. And that's necessary because if you read chapter 12 and you read chapter 13, chapter 12 talks about the dragon chasing the woman. He knows he's got a short time. And chapter 13 talks about these beasts. It might seem like those that be against us are more than those that be for us. And if you recognize the scripture I'm kind of alluding to, Elisha prayed for his servant when they were surrounded by armies of the enemy and prayed, God, open the eyes of my servant so that he could see those that be for us are more than those that be against us. And just like God had to touch Elisha's servant's eyes to see that, and suddenly his eyes were open, he saw horses and chariots of fire far greater in multitude than the enemy ever could be, which he was initially afraid of to begin with. But then he saw these other armies from God. Then he realized by a touch of God that it's all right. And so here we have in Revelation 14, a touch of God, a vision to let us know in the natural, it might seem bad, but praise God, a vision opened up and John saw Jesus with an army on Mount Zion. Praise God. So there it is. A lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. So while the beast was just said to have the mark of the beast put on the foreheads and hands of his followers, there were people left aside from that who had the father's name on their foreheads. And by the way, that started in Revelation chapter 7 when an angel put on the foreheads of the 144,000 the seal of God. Now Psalm 2, I talked about Psalm 110 verse 1 and 2. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand. But Psalm 2 talks about Jesus on Mount Zion and is a perfect correlation to what we're reading now in Revelation 14 about Jesus on Mount Zion. Look at this in Psalm 2, verse 1 to 3. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And by the way, in Acts chapter 4, they're having a prayer meeting because Peter and John had been persecuted for healing a man at the temple. And then they came to the church for prayer. They quoted this same psalm. So you already see the apostles referring to Psalm 2 in Acts chapter 4 during persecution. And it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together. And in Acts chapter 4, it interprets that as Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, the kings of the earth. Set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. There's no fear to be had for God's people. And God will look at that and it doesn't flinch God one bit whatsoever. He laughs at that stuff. 
And he says, the Lord shall have them in derision. He will deride them, mock and laugh at them. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And here's what he'll say. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare to the decree, the Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So in verse 6, it's like the father speaking, I've set my son, my king on the hill of Zion. And then in response, the son of God is saying, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So despite the beast over the world and conquering, Jesus Christ is on Mount Zion and he's already king over all nations. You know, we need to understand, according to the Bible, he's not going to be king over the earth. He is king right now and he's been king since he ascended up into heaven and sat on that right hand, that according to Psalm 110 verse 2 says, he would rule in the midst of his enemies from Mount Zion. So the beast rises from the sea, the sea beast, a beast rises from the land, but Jesus is on Mount Zion. Now let's go to Isaiah 2. We just went to Psalm 2, but look at Isaiah 2. Verses 2 to 3, it shall come to pass in the last days. And let me pause there and say, remember what Peter said on the day of Pentecost? Joel prophesied God would pour his spirit out on all flesh in the last days. Peter said this, the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, was what Joel was talking about, about his spirit being poured out in the last days. You know, that I've got to say something. It amazes me. I've actually shown that to people. I've shown them Acts chapter 2, where Peter's quoting Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh, and showed them where Peter said this, that was happening on the day of Pentecost, is that which Joel said would happen in the last days. So how could this be that if the last days weren't occurring that time in history on the day of Pentecost? How could the last days be now if Peter said what was happening on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 was the last days? Now, you've got an apostle telling you that. That's not like somebody today claiming that they think this is the last days or these are the last days. This is the apostle Peter to whom Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom who said, what you're seeing right now with people speaking in other tongues, 2,000 years ago he's talking on the day of Pentecost, when it happened in Acts 2, this is what Joel was talking about when he said God's Spirit would be poured out in the last days. So Isaiah 2 is referring to those same last days. There's not two sets of last days. There's not like last days in the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, and now we've got last days also today. And some people say, well, They'll change from this argument very quickly, but they'll say when they're caught like this, well, the last days started then. Now, it's been 2,000 years. The law with Moses only lasted 1,500 years. And then Jesus came. So for a time period that's lasted longer than the entire period of law and old covenant to be called the last days is just absurd. It's ridiculous. It's the last days of the law. It's the last days of the old covenant. Jesus Christ had ripped the veil on the temple, went up to that throne and sat down. And 40 years later, Rome came and smashed that temple to the ground as God used them as his rod of affliction against Jerusalem because they rejected him on the cross and crucified him. So in those last days of the law, in the last days of that old covenant, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths for out of Zion, that is the mountain of God. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And speaking of the day of Pentecost, Jesus had gone to Mount Zion and had sat on that throne 
which is why Peter said the Spirit is poured out. Read it in Acts chapter 2. He said, this is happening because Jesus sat down at that right hand. Remember he said, I've got to go to the Father so that the Comforter can come. What he meant was, he's got to go to that throne in heaven and sit down with his Father in his throne. Revelation 3 and 21. So that he could pour out this Spirit on all flesh. Joel. And in Acts chapter 2. And so, Zion is connected to this first century period that the apostles, not me, the apostles, contrary to what a lot of Bible teachers are saying today, the apostles said the last days were in their day. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Chapter 1 says, God who at sundry times and in times past spoke unto his people by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. It's referring to the days when Hebrews was written, the first century, that their time was these last days. And so you'll show this to people and they'll say, no, no, the Spirit's being poured out now. We're in the last days. Well, Peter said the last days were back then. And that didn't mean the Spirit wouldn't be poured out now. In order for somebody to say, these are the last days, or else the Spirit's not being poured out today. When Peter said the last days were at the time of the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was actually poured out, the reason they say that is because they got it stuck in their minds that these are the last days in the year 2019. And they can't get it out. If you can allow yourself to just step aside for a moment and think outside that traditional box and accept what the Bible's actually saying. The Bible never said that our few, our days in the year 2019 are the last days. It distinctly said these last days when it was written. Peter distinctly said when Joel referred to the last days, spirit being poured out, it was what was happening then on the day of Pentecost. And there's another scripture that at the ends of the world, Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, are we in the end of the world and Jesus is being crucified now? No. In the first century when Jesus was crucified, it was called the ends of the earth or the ends of the world. And so that is talking about what Revelation chapter 14 is saying. He's on Mount Zion. And when it says that people will come to the mountain of the Lord, Hebrews chapter 12 and 22 says, you and I have come unto Mount Zion. And then if you keep reading, it says the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable company of angels, to the church of the living God, the church of the firstborn. And so if we have come to Mount Zion in Hebrews 12 and 22, and Isaiah said, people shall come to the mountain of the Lord. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Out of Zion is going to go forth the law. Then folks, Hebrews 12, 22 is telling us that this is already in effect. This isn't something that's going to happen in some future millennium. This is something that's been happening since the day of Pentecost. Praise God. And Jesus, having ascended up, sat on that right hand on Mount Zion in heaven. And then some people might say, well, it's on earth he has to be ruling the earth, not in heaven, because David's throne was on earth and he's going to sit on his father's throne, David's throne. Who said David's throne has to be located on earth? David's throne was in earthly Zion. What God is trying to show us is that when Jesus sat on the throne in heavenly Zion, David's throne was just a shadow of what Jesus would be ruling from. So it used Zion in heaven as the antitype or the fulfillment of the shadow of earthly Zion. You see, everything in earth is a shadow of something in the spiritual. Everything physical in the natural is a shadow of something more real and more spiritual and greater. Always greater if it's in the spiritual. And the heavenly Zion and, and earthly Zion are related. And that's why Jesus is on David's throne because he's on Mount Zion in heaven. It's not talking about where it's located on the earth in order for him to be sitting on the throne of David. And if you carefully read Acts chapter 2, it'll tell you that because he was told to sit on his father David's throne, now, therefore, 
he is seated at the right hand. You wouldn't say, therefore, he's seated at the right hand if it wasn't telling you that fulfilling that prophecy that sitting on David's throne would happen to Jesus. That wouldn't, if that wasn't the case, you wouldn't say, therefore, he's at the right hand. Read Acts chapter 2. It's, it's a blessing. So Daniel chapter 2 verse 34 also talks about a mountain. Remember the vision, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and forgot? And then he rebuked and scolded his prophets because they, they didn't know it. And here he's expecting Daniel and his prophets to know that what he dreamed that he himself forgot. But Daniel got it. He heard from God. He said, Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then when you go down to verse 44, and in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. The Babylonians left their kingdom to the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians left their kingdom to the Grecians. And the Grecians left their kingdom to the Romans. But this kingdom of Jesus Christ will not be left to other people. He's going to break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And that it break in pieces iron, brass, clay, silver, and gold. The great God has shown to the king... What shall come to pass hereafter, the dream is certain, the interpretation thereof, sure. That mountain that grew is also talking about Mount Zion. And in Micah chapter 4, verse 1, in the last days, there it is again, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, higher than all the other mountains, Isaiah said. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And isn't it awesome? In the city of Jerusalem, where David was king on earthly Zion, the day of Pentecost had Peter shout out and preaching in the fire and power of the Holy Ghost, and telling them that Jesus had gone to Mount Zion and sat on the right-hand throne and poured out his Spirit. The same Zion by name, but in heaven. And from there, that message of Acts 2.38, apostolic salvation, went until it's reached us way over here in North America and went all around the world. How many times has it gone around the world already? And praise God, it all started in the very city where David was king to foreshadow that Jesus is king right now. That's what Peter was preaching. Jesus was king already. He's not going to be king, folks. He already is king. Praise God. Now, you might not have known this, but, but the Garden of Eden was associated with a mountain. Look in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Okay, you've got the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. And I'm not concerned about who this is as much as I'm concerned about what you're going to read about the garden. Because after it talks about the garden of God, Eden, whoever he's speaking to, he said, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou art upon the holy mountain of God. Do you see how in Ezekiel 28, a mountain of God is associated with the Garden of Eden? There was a mountain in the Garden of Eden. And remember it said that there was a river that came out of Eden to water the garden? And, and I could picture that mountain, and it's splitting into four rivers and going to the rest of the earth with four rivers coming down it and going and watering the world. So when we're reading Revelation 14, and the last man, Adam, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is on Mount Zion like Adam was on the mountain in Eden, we're seeing a restoration of the kingdom of God from the Garden of Eden. 
God put Adam in the earth to have dominion in the earth. And praise God, folks, Jesus Christ is the last man, Adam, and he has dominion on the earth. He doesn't have to be walking on this earth for him to have dominion over the earth. Because Ephesians chapter 1 told us that the same power that raised up Christ from the dead and put him at his own right hand in heavenly places, put him there above every name that is named, every power that is that is that is, exists. And not only in this world or this age, but also the age to come. So he's already over the world. It boggles my mind when I think of this because so many Christians, they never think of Jesus like that. They think of him, well, he's our king. He's king over the church, but he's not king over the world yet because look at the mess that the world's in. But when he comes back, he'll be king over the world and there'll be no more mess. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches in Psalm 110 and 1 that he would sit on that throne at the right hand until his enemies are made his footstool. If he was going to rule after the mess is cleaned up, he would sit after his enemies are made his footstool. Think about it. Let me say it again. If he's not going to rule when the world's in a mess, and he can't be ruling if the world's in a mess, why did Psalm 110 and 1 say, he sits until his enemies are made his footstool. If these folks were right and he's not ruling because there's a mess, it would instead say he sits after his enemies are made his footstool. But that's not what it says. So don't look at the world and look for a perfect world before you can believe Jesus rules. Because Psalm 110 and 1 says he'll be ruling until, not after, his enemies are made his footstool. Now, if they're not his footstool, that's why Psalm 110 verse 2 says, Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That's why, why enemy, while enemies are still around, rule. Now, everybody says, well, in the millennium, all the mess is going to be cleaned up. And they think that's the dominion, that's the kingdom age. Well, Psalm 110 talking about the kingdom age says he rules in the midst of his enemies. So, how could the millennium clean things up so he can rule if Psalm 110 says he rules in the midst of his enemies? The millennium represents now. I might as well just come right out and say it. The millennium that you read about in Revelation 20, a thousand years, is as much a symbolic number as the symbolic picture of Jesus as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes represents Jesus. It's symbolism. Even the number of years is symbolic. Just like seven horns and seven eyes, all power and all understanding, seven means all, a thousand years just means a very long, huge amount of time. Not necessarily the number of years one after 999 of them occurred. So look at another one, Isaiah 11 and 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's what's happening. The knowledge of the Lord is spreading across the earth. David was on Zion on earth. And Jesus, the son of David, is on Zion in heaven. Praise God. And he's ruling over the earth as David ruled over Israel. And the 144,000 are with him. That's the church. That is a symbolic number. If you go to Revelation 7, you see 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And they're not even the regular number of tribes or named tribes that there are. They're the, the number of tribes, but not the names. You see, Dan as a tribe is not even mentioned in Revelation 7. But Dan was a tribe. And Joseph was never called a tribe. Ephraim, his son, and Manasseh, his son. They were two tribes. But Joseph was, but yet it says the tribe of Joseph in Revelation. You see, Revelation is symbolic. If you're looking for realities in the book of Revelation when you read these things, you're going to come across a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, and you're going to scratch your head and say, what kind of nonsense is this? But when you realize it's symbolic, then you get it. And that's why even the numbers in Revelation are symbolic. 144, I mean, think about it. There's exactly 12,000, not 12,003, not 11,994 from a tribe, but exactly 12,000 from me. 
you know it's symbolic. And 12 is the number of government. 12 months of the year govern the seasons. 12 tribes govern Israel. 12 apostles govern the church. And so the 144,000 is a kingdom number. 12 times 1,000 times 12. It's like government multiplied by government a thousand times. It's just government on steroids. <laughs> Kingdom of God to the max. That's what it's talking about. And that's what the church is. Praise God. And the seal of God's on their foreheads on this Mount Zion with the Lamb Jesus Christ, the church. See in Revelation 13, 3 and 12, Him that overcometh. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. That's what you're reading in Revelation 14 on the foreheads of the 144,000. The Father's name is on their foreheads. Now people say that's not the church. That's a select, they believe it's literally 144,000, not a symbolic number at all. And that's Israelites, Jews only not the church. They will tell you the church isn't even mentioned after Revelation chapter 3. But these 144,000 with the Father's name on their foreheads are directly connected to Revelation 3 and 12 when he talked to one of the churches. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation are talking to seven churches. Churches. And what they claim is not speaking about churches when the 144,000 are mentioned with the Father's name on their foreheads, is exactly what is said to the church here in Revelation 3 and 12. The name of God would be written on these church members. So how could the 144,000 not be part of the church? Because it says there were 144,000 from all these tribes. When on their foreheads was the name of God, the Father, and God told a church in Revelation 3 and 12, he would write on their foreheads the name of God. Praise God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Writing on people, writing on believers that they're the New Jerusalem. The name of God's on them. And that New Jerusalem comes down from heaven from my God and I will write upon him my new name. Look what he writes on these people in this church in Revelation 3. The name of God the name of the city, which is New Jerusalem, and my new name. <laughs> Folks, don't let anyone tell you the 144,000 aren't the church, and the church isn't here then. Remember, this already happened anyway, and the church was here then. So these 144,000 in the first century represent the remnant of the church from Israel who served Jesus, like Paul said that he was in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. He says, God has not cast away his people. I'm a Jew, Paul said, but I'm the remnant. I'm one of the remnant. And in Revelation 14 and 2, I heard a voice from heaven as of the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. Thinking, Think of a voice that sounds like thunder booming out of the heavens. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Heaven is joining these 144,000 that are singing. What a beautiful vision. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So what you're reading about with a new song is like there's a new epoch starting. There's a new era. Something has broken. Something has changed. There's a victory here. With the defeat of the beast and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, something changed in the world and changed in the spiritual realm. And in chapter 5, verse 9, this is chapter 14 we're looking at and comparing it with chapter 5 and 9 and look at the same idea. They sung a new song. Remember when John said nobody was worthy to go take the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And then he started weeping and, and a voice said, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed to take the book. And he looks for a lion and he sees a lamb as it had been slain, standing up, the resurrected Jesus, hallelujah. And he goes to that throne, takes that book, and then he hears the beasts and the cherubims, the cherubims sing a new song. 
and they're saying, and you're worthy to take the book, open the seals because you were slain. You redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred tongue and people and nation. Something changed, didn't it, when Jesus ascended up? I'm saying tonight that when Jesus went up into heaven, 40 days after he resurrected, Revelation 5 is telling us what happened in heaven after he got there. He went to that throne like he said he was going to sit down at the right hand. And when he went to that throne, he redeemed us to God because the high priest would go past the veil into the holiest, sprinkle the mercy seat with blood to make atonement for Israel once a year. But Jesus wasn't going to do this once a year. He did it once and forever. He went up into the real holiest of holies in heaven, went to the real mercy seat on the ark, the throne of God, and that's by his blood where he redeemed us. So a new song was in chapter 5, and a new song is in Revelation 14. And back in chapter 14, verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women. Now, does this mean these 144,000 were actually 144,000 men only, only men, and they're not defiled with women? They had no physical relationship. They were virgins for they are virgins. For these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Is this talking about some elite Jewish people or, or Israelite people in the future that are physically virgins? No. This, again, is very spiritual. What you're reading, and I've highlighted it in yellow and emboldened it and underlined it, these are references you'll find in the rest of the New Testament that refer to the church people. Watch this. They're spiritual terms. You see, in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, Paul was talking to the church at Corinth. And I emphasize church because people always say the 144,000 aren't the church. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He meant by being a chaste virgin, they weren't given to idolatry. They weren't worshiping Rome. They weren't worshiping the Caesars like the religious leaders were doing. We have no king but Caesar, they said. You're Pilate, you're not a friend of Caesar if you don't crucify him. These were Christians that were faithful. You see, God looks at us as pure and unadulterated when we go to no other gods but him. And so these chaste virgins that Paul called them in Corinth as Christians was exactly the idea that 144,000 are trying to describe when it says they weren't defiled with women, they're virgins. In Matthew 9 and 9, as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at receipt of custom. And he said unto me, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Did you notice that the 144,000, they're not only not defiled with women, but they follow the lamb wherever he goes. I've just showed you a reference to Christians in the church that they were supposed to be virgins. And now I'm showing you that Jesus is talking to people that would be members of the church to follow him. The very two things that the 144,000 do. And so then it mentions first fruits unto God. They're the first fruits to God. A first fruits in the Old Testament was a special sacrifice. It was gathered first before the rest of the harvest was even ripe. And because it became ripe, they dedicated to God. And it's saying that these people are like a first fruits. They're special sacrifices. You see, the church of the last days was when the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. It's the first generation of the church, the people in the first century that were saved. It's the last days of the law, but it's like the first generation of the new born again kingdom of God saints. And because they were the first generation, like the first fruits was first ripened and given to God, these first century believers that went through a Gehenna Hades Sheol on earth <laughs> were like special to God. 
He spoke of Old Testament Israel when she was in her youth and she started out with God like the church in her youth in the first century. And look what Jeremiah 2 verses 2 to 3 says to Israel when they first knew God, like the early church when they first came into the kingdom. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee the kindness of thy youth. He's talking to the youthfulness of Israel. And I'm going to compare that with the church. The love of thine espousals. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness. You see, people were espoused like a hyper engagement. We get engaged before we get married. Back in Israel, it was more serious than an engagement. They were espoused. They actually called them husband and wife before they were married when they were espoused. Can you imagine getting engaged to somebody and then you're called husband and wife? It wasn't a marriage, but it was an espousal. And remember, Paul said, I've espoused you to Christ as a chaste virgin. He said, when Israel was young, first knew God when Moses took them out of Israel. He said, when you went after me in the wilderness, remember they left Egypt, went in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. Look at this. He's calling it the first fruits, the first generation of Israel. When they first came out of Egypt, <clears throat> generations before David's time, Solomon's time, and all these other kings, and off into the, the prophets, Jeremiah and Daniel's day and all of that. Go back to the beginning of Israel as a nation when they first met God when they left, wilderness, left Egypt into the wilderness. They were called the first fruits. That's like the early church was like the first fruits because it was the first generation. It is talking about the church when it's talking about the 144,000. Now back to Revelation 14. This is what else it says about these 144,000 in verse 5. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now remember the dragon spoke lies that sinners believed? Well, these 144,000, there's no guile found in their mouth. And look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 to 25, where you see the same thing that was described to be with the 144,000, no lies, no guile. Look what Paul says. To church members, put on the new man, which after God's created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Every single detail it's telling you that the 144,000 had were things that were spoken to the church. And people say they're not church members. And the worst lie of all, by the way, is idolatry. Watch how the Bible refers to idolatry as a wicked lie. In Romans 1 and 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. See, you get, you're worshiping images now. That's idolatry. Made like to corruptible men and birds, four-footed beasts and creeping things. They were worshiping idols in the shape of animals. Wherefore, God also gave them up through to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who change the truth of God into a lie. When it says they change the glory of God into an image, he says that's changing the truth of God into a lie. It's saying that idol, idol worship, idolatry, is lying. And there was no guile found in their mouth. They were virgins. They were not defiled with women. It's saying, spiritually speaking, that these Christians, yes, they were Christians, weren't involved in idolatry, had listened to preachers like Paul the Apostle, had no lying among them, and would never turn the truth of God into a lie by worshiping an image and an idol. And in Jeremiah 23 and 14, and I'm going to bring this down, we're closing 15 minutes early tonight because I want to spend the last 15 minutes in questions and answers. But in Jeremiah 23 and 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They're all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. And by the way, if you read Romans 1, when it talks about turning the truth of God into a lie and changing the image of the glory of God to a, or the glory of God into an image, keep reading. It talks about homosexuality. 
just like Jeremiah 23 starts talking about homosexuality in Sodom and Gomorrah. So folks, it's interesting how that happened. And we see that in scriptures. So in closing for this evening, when Jerusalem was judged by God, he had raised up a faithful remnant of church members who did not backslide like so many others did. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written. Did you know this? It was written because there was like a wholesale backsliding of former Jews back into Judaism of the old covenant, away from the truth of Jesus Christ because of the persecution. But people like Paul stood. And in Revelation 12, they loved not their lives to the death. And they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Praise God. And in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, it also talks about the remnant. So the 144,000 are the remnant of New Testament church people who remain faithful to God in the midst of all of this wickedness. And so we're going to continue next week, partway through Revelation 14, and go further and discuss the rest of it. And I'm going to show you, I'll give you a little hint of what we're going to talk about next, uh, next week. Jesus is there on Mount Zion. And then you're going to read next of three angels on one side of them that start pronouncing things, victory and judgment against the enemies. And then there are going to be three more angels that are going to actually do a work of assisting Jesus in causing judgment to happen. You'll read about three angels, then you'll hear about Jesus, and then you'll read about three more angels. And it's interesting because it's like the candlestick. You got the staff in the middle, Jesus, with three angels on either side. The seven, and that's a perfect, beautiful picture of what you're going to read about. And this is a pause. It's a beautiful time of stopping in the midst of all this horror and reminding the believer, just like you need to be reminded when you're, if you're going through a hard time tonight, if things aren't going good for you, you're getting a pause here tonight and you're being shown that Jesus Christ is on Mount Zion. There's a faithful army with him and bless God, hold on because joy comes in the morning. Praise God. God will get you through. He got the church through that veritable hell on earth in the first century. And the church is triumphant and look at where the church is today. All over the world, millions of people professing Jesus. Bill, there's, it's gotten into the billions. And all after that hard time and horrible period in the first century, we made it through and you'll make it through too. So hold on. We're now going to some questions and answers in just a moment.